Hi, and welcome to another episode of Twice as Hard. I am Janelle Benjamin, founder and CEO of All Things Equitable, here with the lovely Crystal Ford. She is the diversity, equity, and inclusion champion from Raleigh, North Carolina, who works in the tech space, also a business owner. Uh, of course, you know, as a Black woman working twice as hard in her personal life and supporting other um, Black women as well through a variety of businesses that we'll talk about as we, we get into the show. But Crystal, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. I'm glad that you're with us too. I just want to kick things off by saying I know that you have um, an EEOC complaint against your employer. So let's talk about that without yeah. name dropping, of course, but let's talk about, you know, first of all, for the viewers who don't know, because um, I'm based in Toronto, Canada, um, a lot of them may not be familiar with the EEOC. Just tell them a little bit about what that is. Yeah. And then we'll get into it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the EEOC uh, is a federal program and a federal agency that supports employers and employee, uh, employees and their rights. Uh, and on behalf of employees or those who have complaints, um, they actually help advocate for you um, and, and help to file complaints against your employer or anytime you feel that you're wrong. Uh, and EEOC stands for Equal Employment, um, what is it? Like opportunity, opportunity council or something like that. Council. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or commission. I think it's commission. commission. That's right. Commission. Mm -hmm. It's been quite a process. Um, mm -hmm. Even getting in, right? Uh, they are very overworked. They have a lot of people, you know, that are reaching out, that are trying to file complaints to see even if, you know, their scenario, their situation, um, is something that could be, you know, taken to litigation. And they're there to help you and walk you through the process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and a lot of times if they take your case on, um, it's at no cost. So that's a huge thing as well. It's a huge resource to know that's available. Fantastic. So tell me, I guess, you know, a, a lot in line with the theme of, of black women working twice as hard is the complaint related in any way to, you know, your sex or your, your gender or your race. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it absolutely is. Um, mm -hmm. My complaint is specifically the combination of mm -hmm. uh, race and gender. Okay. And um, it, it's one of those things where the situation, and we can, we can get into that. I can, you know, tell the scenario. I was looking at it from one perspective mm -hmm. and it took uh, me speaking to an attorney, um, you know, that he couldn't take the case on because he's actually out of Florida, but he, I had reached out to him and he was just so intrigued and he was like, well, I'll help kind of walk you through, but I just can't you know, be the representation. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was explaining the situation to him, you know, I wasn't coming from a race angle. Right. Um, he brought that up and he's an older white man. Mm -hmm. He brought up, you know, he's like, this sounds like, you know, a title seven, um, you know, violation, you mm -hmm. should maybe approach it that way. And when he said that, I was just kind of like, I mean, you know, I, I, one thing about us, I do know, um, as black women, black people, we, we have a lot of integrity, especially I, when it comes around race or situations like that. And mm -hmm. it's not one card I want to throw out there unless I am absolutely 100% sure. That's the right. other side of that is that we are often in situations where we have just been conditioned to ignore some certain things or accept mm -hmm. things as just, oh, that's just how it is. And we don't even realize the violations. So, that's so true. It, it took an older white man to say, hey, that's what it is. And even when he said that, I, I wasn't comfortable with mm -hmm. it because I never had looked at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I talked to a couple other people, uh, a white female. I'd been telling her about my experience there when I first got mm -hmm. to the organization. It was a review I got and it was very it was slandering and just it, it was an attack almost. And I expressed that to her over a year ago. And then mm -hmm. I was telling her about the conversation I'd had uh, with the attorney and about being race. And she was like, yeah, I, I thought that's what you were saying a year ago. She was like that. I'm a white female. And when you showed me those um, reviews, I, I absolutely thought it was race. And again, I was just <laughs> Lord, like, you know, so it, it just, it, it, it really blew me away and it blew me away that I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware of um, it for myself. I had just been yeah. ignoring it. And I love that you're talking about this because 
I coined this concept. I, I think I'm crediting myself with coining this concept called global racial gaslighting, right? Where, you know, we are gaslit all the yeah. time in a variety of ways that cause us to question ourselves and call into doubt our own experiences, right? Did that just happen because I'm this or that or, you know, and, and like you said, we don't actually know you know, all the yeah. time when something happens to us, is that because I'm a woman? Is that because I'm young? Is that because I'm beautiful? Is it because I, whatever, right? Yes. It causes yes. us to question our, our own, own experiences um, when to others, it may just be obvious and apparent, right? That we can't turn it off, right? We, on, on site, people see us um, and this unique intersection of being black and women, and women you know, known as massage noir, it, it combines to create a unique experience. And so, you know, kudos to your, your um, attorney for being able to point that out. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and let you know that, you know, you did have also that, uh, that additional claim. So tell us a little bit about the experience, like what brought you to, to the claim? Yeah. So I've been in the tech industry for many years, um, specifically in customer success, mm -hmm. um, client base and roles. And I came to this organization, the organization that I'm talking about, and it was really to bring in customer, su uh, customer success experience. Okay. Um, so I already knew that it was going to be a little bit of, um, you know, some pushback, right? Because it would be mm -hmm. making the team like hybrid team. It was, uh, the team was more cons uh, consisted of customer service and support mm -hmm. versus uh, proactive approaching and, you know, strategic type management. So I already knew that. Okay, right. that's cool. But then when I got in, you know, it was just so much pushback, you know, uh, on the team itself, uh, people not participating, um, not backing you, ignoring your requests for onboarding. Help. I mean, just, it was these little microaggression things mm -hmm. that what I saw was like, okay, this is just a toxic environment. This is just hostile. Right. Still never race. I just... I never really faced that at work. I've never seen it as far as, you know, blatantly. Okay. Mine's not there. Um, and I would go to my um, manager, supervisor, and I'd talk to him about it in our one-on-ones. And he was still very backing of me. And I like everything that you're doing. You know, don't worry about this feedback. Yeah, it, you know, it's very, it was attacking. He um, acknowledged that the team was like this. It was a group of friends that had been together. Um and the logic around it or the solution, not just from him, but other um, uh, leadership was, well, that's why we're hiring people like you. And he didn't mean black. He meant uh, CS uh, people, professionals who've had actually experience so mm -hmm. that you guys can come in and over time, you'll be the majority and overrule them. That literally <laughs> was the solution. Okay. And I was like, oh, Okay, you know, because mm -hmm. I already prepped myself. I knew it was going to yep. be some pushback. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'll give it a little time. And just over time, the dynamics within this organization, seeing how they related to each other. And it wasn't just like directly to me. It was one of their uh, values is share by default. Yep. And, you know, it we get it as a value and it sounds good on paper, but it became more of a shame by default. You know, if people would raise up a question or have something to say. It was always this doggy dog type of camaraderie. It, it was just, it was really bad. Um, and so long story short, I wanted to get out of that team, look at other opportunities. And there was another opportunity within marketing. And mm -hmm. I absolutely um, wanted to go for that. They reached out to me. And long story short, I had been strung along. I had interviewed for the job. Mm -hmm. um, I was basically promised the job. They told me to reach out to my manager, let them know um, yeah. that they were interviewing me and that I would be transitioning over. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a few weeks went by and, and come to find out they changed the job description and they went with someone outside the organization, mm -hmm. um, a younger white female. So still... Mm -hmm. I did not look at it as, I, I just didn't, and it's, hearing myself say it now, I didn't look at it like that. I just thought, you know, but, you know, the uh, HR recruiter within, mm -hmm. and um, at this point I was talking with the CMO, like she was the one that was really pushing it. 
um, both were saying, you know, we want you in marketing. Please right. do not look anywhere else. Please do not apply anywhere else. We are creating position for you. Okay. Okay. So at this mm -hmm. time, you know, I'm more disengaging from my role uh, and kind of focusing there. This went on, um, it, actually, this April makes it a year. Mm -hmm. And I was officially told, like, the day before uh, Black History Month that um, the, the role was not happening. And of course, the, they, the, couldn't, they couldn't tell you in February. <laughs> oh, oh, right. In the midst of this time, in this time, you know, the lady who was uh, advocating for me, uh, mm -hmm. CMO, she left the organization. So, you know, and had admitted to everyone that there had been promises that, you know, this role was supposed to be mine. I had already started transitioning at this point out of my role. So I was not really engaging in relationships on my team, mm -hmm. starting to do work on marketing, and they just dropped the ball. Oh and God. so, yeah. So in addition to that, I already was doing the DEI work. Right. And I became basically the face of DEI. And um, I, you know, I was just like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. And so on February 1st, the first mm -hmm. day of like history month, I stood up and I was like, you know what? I'm good. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be in that role. I'm going to focus back on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I trust that you guys have it and happy black history month. So I stopped doing that on that time. And good for you. Like, thank you. I was going through it. I was realizing, um, you know, just hearing other people in the organization, it was definitely an issue um, mm -hmm. uh, around women. Yeah. And, specifically black women. It was hard for me to see that with black women or black people because we didn't have enough black people there to even have data on that. Right, right. So I didn't even see that. Um, and that's where I'm going. So I'm, I'm pushing forward. Oh my God, there's so much to unpack in, I in, know. in what you just shared. Um, just in terms of us, you know, having these experiences and not realizing it, you know? Yeah just not knowing even as it might be blatant to some other people, right? Yeah. And we're in the situation sort of being blind to the experiences. And I wanna start with the fact that, you know, you, you were able to immediately say that wasn't because I was black. When you, when you said, you know, what his state, what your boss's statement was and when you made that hiring decision, you know, we want the best, it was almost saying we want the best person. We want someone like you but it, it, your blackness didn't relate to, to that, right? He wanted you for your right. talent, skills, and abilities, which is what it should be about. But how did you instinctively know that your blackness was, yeah. wasn't at that play? That it was not? Um, yeah, how did you know? Like, because, you know, a lot of the viewers are, are, are probably questioning, you know, again, you know, are these yeah. experiences real? Do black women really work twice as hard? And we know when something is racist and blatantly racist, and we might say that to other people and they might be, that wasn't racist. That was because blah, 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 blah. They start to kind of gaslight you and, and give you, you know, the other whatabouts. It was about this or it was about that. But we yeah. automatically know when our race is implicated. But similarly, we also know when it's not. We know when you're treating us differently because, uh, you know, I'm a woman. I'm a beautiful woman. I'm in a skirt today. Or you're giving me this favor because you want something from me. You want me to run your Black History Month events. Or, or we know when our race is in, in play and when it's not. And I think it's it's important for us to have this conversation so that people start to to believe us when we say yeah, that, was, that was racist, right? Yeah. This wasn't racist, but that was racist. And so how did you in that moment know what he meant didn't relate to the color of your skin? Right, well, that came um, during the interviewing process and recruiting. Mm -hmm. I understood the dynamics of the team, like those who were already on the team and myself. And I was uh, the first CSM to come in with mm -hmm. actual a background in that. Um, okay. everyone else was kind of hybrid from other roles. Right. So when he said that, I did understand that. Also, he's not American. Right. Uh, he is a white male. He's not American. And I'll, I'll just say it, there is a different, there's a difference. I'm not saying there's no racism outside, but there was a difference that I understood what he was saying, that it was not that. Mm -hmm. However, and to this day, he himself, I do not believe is racist uh the opposite the, the issue there is his leadership 
Mm. And when a person or an employee raises up, hey, I'm in this type of environment, right? who as a leader don't advocate to get them out of that or to eradicate the issue, that, mm -hmm. that then becomes feeding into right. uh, the organization as a whole that has racist practices. Right. This is such an important conversation. <laughs> this is so important because a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, they're always crying racism, right? Yeah. Or we can tell the difference, right? You're we saying this wasn't difference. racist. This was just his leadership. This is his leadership. So mm -hmm. it could be that and I had this respect for him because I knew it was just that. I liked him. You know, I still like him as a person. Right. But then when I start looking, when I, when I was encouraged to look at it as a race thing, and I mm -hmm. started looking into other scenarios, the organization as a whole, as a practice of right. race, okay. not what he was doing. So right. we even yeah. it was outside of his hands, right? Mm -hmm. And I went on to HR, the head of uh, HR knew of the scenarios okay. and they dropped the ball. It was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So he kind of played into it, but not intentionally playing okay. into it. Right. Um, Maybe there was some pressure on him. It could, it could right? have been. Very pressure much. from the system to, to do what the system always does. Very much so. And, and, and the other side of it is that we all could be in a racist environment and be practicing racism in a sense, benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he needed, there's some things in leadership he needs. However, right. even in this time, he moved from director to VP. Mm hmm uh, so it's just things like that, not even realizing he may not even realize his advantage, his privilege. Oh, and, man. Yeah. And so again, goosebumps, because I literally just left a training this morning where we talked about unearned advantage, white privilege, things that you get yeah. that you don't even know that you that you're that, that you're, you're getting. not even getting. And you and can the, feeling you're advocating and an ally yeah. and all of that. But I just sat back and allowed things to unfold. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, all of these things are examples of what it is. And that's the thing about racism and, and being racist and all that. It is so sly. It's not, it's like air, right? It it's really just like is. you feel, mm -hmm. you breathe it, but you can't mm -hmm. really articulate it. Like, hey, look at the air. You can't say that yeah. unless you it's, win. Dirt. It's in the system. It's in everything all around us all the time. So it's interesting that you say that, you know, it's in the air, but yet here comes a younger white woman into the role and you don't feel that that's racist it, why did you why did you miss that because i had not been in marketing in a corporate setting before so okay. i was already coming with a little inferiority okay not, you know, i mean mm -hmm. i've been in customer success i've done customer advocacy for a while but it was that and okay. um i was introduced to the role it was by another employee, a black employee. He was moving from uh, that role to another role within marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and when they changed the de job description, it made it a more senior role. So then I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I'm not seeing, you know, st just still not. And then I'm gonna tell you another reason why I didn't see it. And I, hopefully this, someone can understand. I have not experienced racism, I don't think, in my career. Mm -hmm. I've been more the exception. I've been the Black person that made it. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't have a degree and I made it to certain figures in salary and I've always made it based on presentation or mm -hmm. maybe how I look or how I can, you know, be in client facing. And it, mm -hmm. so I, it just, it was a, um, a burst to a bubble, ego or whatever. But I never saw it because it's never, I've always been the exception. Right. And right. That, that, so everything was like, no, that's not it. And it's not that I would never deny that that's happening for other people or, or, mm -hmm. or black people at all. I mean, absolutely. I, I can right. see it. And I'll call it out. But you've been able to achieve yeah. success. And so it makes it difficult to, yes. to see it, to know when it's happening to you. Because right. you don't expect it anymore. You, you don't you, expect it. You know, you, you apply for jobs, you get them. You, you know, you're shining at work, you're doing all the things in every place that you've worked. And so it would be easy for you to kind of miss it when it's right in your face. So tell me, you know, then how, how is it that the lawyer then tells you that this is, this is what it is? So I went shot to him because I was going for, um, 
uh, gosh, I can't, it's escaping me now, uh, but just basically misleading someone, you know, um, false promises. Representation of oh, false promises, okay. Mm -hmm. False promises. So I kind of researched that and I was like, yeah, you know, and there's been clear, you know, instances where I've been told, don't look, don't apply, please, you know, like, you know, I, I've had about three people reach out to me, um, mm -hmm. former uh, colleagues from other organizations. Hey, Crystal, you know, we have this role opening up. I would love for you to come here. And I'm like, no, nah, you know, I'm working on this marketing role that's coming open here. So like there was many opportunities I was missing out. Right. Not only was I missing out, I wasn't building this relationship on my current team because I knew in a minute I'd be transitioning out. So all of this, I'm just like, and all of this was on false promises. Mm -hmm. And I pitched this to him knowing I'm strong with that. Like, hey, there's no denying that. And he's right. like, yeah, you know, I can see that. He was like, but you know, this sounds more like a Title Seven, you know, um, uh, violation. I didn't even know what that was at the time. <laughs> I mean, to that degree. Mm -hmm. And you know, more on race. And I was just like, a little bit, I was like, like, listen, when it comes to that, I do not play, you know, like, I, and I think, I think we are, I do not throw that out. I'm not going to be a, a Karen, so to speak, when it comes to that. Right. If it is, it is, and I will call it out, but I'm not going to play that card ever. However, because this ordeal had been so crazy for me, uh, damaging mm -hmm. for me, I wasn't mm -hmm. going to let it go. So I had this integrity thing of how do I say that it's that when I don't feel it's that? You don't know, right? You know, it's, I didn't, really yeah. How do I say that? But at the same time, I cannot let this go. Do I just roll with that? So I, it was, I was really battling. And then mm -hmm. he asked me something because I think he saw that and he was like, well, let me just ask you this. Do you think this would have happened had you been a white woman? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, absolutely not. I don't know how I was able to answer so quickly. And he was just like, <laughs> there you go. I just took it like, oh, snap. I mean, you know what I mean? So I yeah. think it's just one of those things where we, and it's not that I was above that. It wasn't. It's just, I realized we accept so much and it takes so much for it to be blatantly in our face. And we expect people to treat us similarly. Yeah. Right, we expect yeah. the best out of humanity, and then when they don't give that to us, yes, that's when the surprise hits. And we don't see representation of it like this, the microaggression. You don't see it because well, by the time it comes to the news and social media, it's mm -hmm. so apparent, right? right? And like my mom, you know, my mother is seventy three, so she never went to school with white people. So I'm mm -hmm. hearing her stories, and it's like right. segregation, da 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 da. And I know we're advanced, but somewhere inside i think it that's our that's our measurement mm -hmm. and it has to be they're straight calling you the n-word for you it to, needs to be that overt or 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 it's not happening or it's, it's not it's like really uh, interesting yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, racism when, does that it causes it's so insidious it causes us to doubt our yeah. own experiences and um you know well good on him for for exposing you to it and, and calling it what it is because we don't have the same experiences as white women, you know, to see a, a white younger woman come into the role, maybe with different qualifications, but yeah. certainly not your years of experience. And, and I can tell that you've been working twice as hard along the way, just from what you say, right? <laughs> if you're able to get these roles, right? By doing all the things to demonstrate your ability and your competence, there's no, you've got to be working twice as hard. So tell me a little bit about that. How has that concept, you know, in, in this podcast sort of resonated for you um in your life can you recall you know just being told from anyone that you need to work twice as hard uh, where did that come from for you yeah absolutely um i would say well, of course my mom and it wasn't necessarily work twice as hard it was more of giving me the confidence of you know she used to always say you know there's no big eyes or little use we are all the same, you know, you put everybody mm -hmm. puts their pants on one leg at a time. And it was a confidence in that. But it was also a knowing that, hey, when you walk in the room, this may be an expectation. So just right. know to be to have your best foot forward. To be that excellent. Was, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was hers was best foot forward. And it wasn't necessarily tied to race, but I understood it because it, it's just an unspoken thing. And right. and you know what I mean? Um now my father, on the other hand, he, he was absolutely 
Todd in, in race and how he mm -hmm. saw things. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was definitely, and I don't know how candid I can be, but I'm, you know, yeah, I'll tell go you for what it. he told yeah. me. <laughs> so um, I remember I was like getting ready. I went to uh, North Carolina a and Mm -hmm. And I was getting ready to like leave out. I think like the day I was getting ready to leave out, my mom, me and my mom was getting ready and he rolled up on his motorcycle and, you know, he was just having a talk with me. And he said, I'm just going to say one thing. He was like, um, you go there, you get your education, you be the best that you can be so that when you get out, you don't have to work for the white man. And mm -hmm. I just remember him saying that. And I was like, okay. I mean, you know, okay. And it was mm -hmm. like 1997. So it wasn't really... A thing of like entrepreneurship and having your own, but it was, it just stuck with me. And I knew how he carried himself. Right. Um, and so there was this push of, to me, do your best, right? So that you have options. That's how Was he I, working for the white man when he said that? Or had he, I'm sorry, say that now. Was he working for white people when he said that? Yeah. Yeah. He was. Very, very much so. Yeah. So it was probably um, his own experience, his own oppression that he was passing over to you like don't be like me have a different experience yes yes mm -hmm. um and just i think like how they were raised you know like we are in the south yeah. um i think people uh black people in the south have taken a lot and still do and and don't realize how resilient we've had to be and are mm -hmm. um and so it was a lot of that too you know right um you know, and, and there's a couple of examples of, of, of just that. And I can't push that enough is not that we need to always look at it from a neg negative perspective of everything is racist and this is, is that, but we do need to be aware that we are letting a lot of things go mm -hmm. and we have to start recognizing that. Um, the company I was with, again, being in tech, you don't see many of black people in tech. You are now, you're starting to see right. more. There's this push but you don't see it. Another mm -hmm. thing that you do not see is you don't see a lot of black people in customer facing roles. You don't right. see it. You don't see a lot of black people in marketing. You just don't. Um, so I was in this role, still in customer success. And um, the, the company itself was headquartered in San Francisco. Okay. So we had some team members come over and we were walking downtown Raleigh. Mm -hmm. um, didn't think anything of it. We were walking to where we we're gonna eat. And I remember one of my colleagues and he was a black male from like the bay area san francisco okay and he was just like there's no way i could live here and i mean you know i know how it is from there he was like we were in downtown he's like those are confederate statues and i had passed by it my whole life i knew but you just you just don't even see it anymore and he was like how right. do you this is right outside your window how do you not see that and i'm like right. and you just feel so it's just an awakening yes. so it's just stuff like that that we need to start trying to pay attention to mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. imagine being in your whole life i'm like 42 been here 42 years and i've never seen it but I've right seen it. yeah yeah <laughs> you pass by it you know some, there's a big white man on some horse mounted in the air like this and 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 yeah we pass by it all the time and we don't it doesn't all strike time. us that <laughs> this is what it is. It's just what it is. It's what mm -hmm. it is. So I think it, George Floyd's death has made it easier for us to to see um, yeah. and to have the conversations and to call things out. You yeah, know, for sure. I think you know it's it's just that that racial record. Like we've had enough. No, we've had enough. It, we, um, we, absolutely. That that has been yeah. that was very monumental. And and to that point, right after that um started um the, the whole george floyd the murder and the riots and all of that and it hit in downtown raleigh and mm. those sets are down um, wow are i'm getting down. goosebumps they knocked them down they knocked them down now this is the caveat to that <laughs> okay they knocked them down and uh they had on the news and they like had uh, like they were dragging it through the street Right. It was like a group of um, it, it was predominantly like uh, young white girls because I think they were they went to state university. There's a lot of colleges around and, you know, they were advocating and allies and all of that. Mm -hmm. But even in that moment, so they're dragging this monument, this statue uh, down the streets of downtown Raleigh on the news. Mm -hmm. And while everyone's like cheering, a lot of us are like, 
even that is white privilege. There is no less. <laughs> In the middle of George Floyd riots, that yeah. we could knock that down. Not only did they drag it down the street, they threw a rope over like a street sign and mm -hmm. hung it. Oh. I was just like, <laughs> it was just, it was on so many levels. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah. thank you, but what? But what um, are you doing? And we can't, and we can't. We should have that rage yes, and, and that should be ours. Behavior. It should be ours. But you're co opting. You're co opting it, and you're you're hanging a statue. And you're hanging it. That was another thing. I was like, first of all, it's a statue. But but right. why is hanging like you, the 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 in the eight thing. things to do? Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it was just things. It was things like that. That um, you know, ultimately, yes, I'm, I'm glad they're down. But I will say this, and I did respond back to uh, my colleague that came from over uh, in San Francisco, and I said, you know, um, yeah, I'm glad it's down, but I would rather it stay up because yeah. I would rather know who and what I'm dealing with mm -hmm. than it to not be up anymore and it's hidden because the person who said it was okay for that statue to be up is still the same person still with the same methodology and thoughts. He's not gone. It's just no longer right. there. So right. I would, as, as you know, backwards as it may seem, I would rather know my enemy and know how mm -hmm. you feel than to not. I would rather a person still walk around in a hood. Than don't, you, don't you think though that those people, I mean, this is how, I, this is what I believe. I think that those people are a dying breed. I think that those people who erected those statues um, and who think that those statues should still exist are a dying breed and, and you know, God forgive me, but when they die, that thinking will change and evolve. And, and if the statue is gone with it, I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, if my children and my children's children don't need to see it and, or be exposed to people who think those things, great. Very, very true. Very, mm -hmm. you're 100% correct. Um, but those people have put systems in place. Right. And they are not as apparent as that statue. Mm. And so then you have like my supervisor who does not even realize that even in his support of me, him being promoted when it is known there needs to be some leadership advancement with him right. is a part of the system that's put in totally. place. And totally. if everything is hidden away, mm -hmm. not, it, it doesn't change because it's very hard to see. You're so right. He becomes that emblem. He becomes like that statue because you just erected him and er, er, right. you know promoted him um, to this leadership role that he probably didn't earn or deserve when Correct. there were equally qualified Black women in the space that could have filled that role. Yes. And so I guess my next question is, how is it that you know, you're going to be working twice as hard to overcome that experience and this this complaint and filing with the EO, EEOC, what, what's next for you? What's happening with the complaint? Yeah, well, we're there. Um, we're doing internal interviews mm -hmm. now um, and haven't taken it all the way, but I, I do have um, I do have a standing where I can take it all the way. I am giving them an opportunity to make it right. Okay. And I'll leave that at that. So we'll see from there. Uh, mm -hmm. But as far as me working twice as hard, it, it, that's a given that mm -hmm. it's going to be that way. I think now what I'm doing is now that I have a, uh, an awareness, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to just work twice as hard in different directions. So twice as hard in DE and I and calling mm -hmm. out companies like we're not doing performative. And let yeah. me explain to you how what you're doing is performative. Mm -hmm. Being honest on reviews, we had a review and they asked, you know, what are some things that we can do? And I clearly put, well, hey, listen to your employees and stop doing performative pr uh, practices like this survey unless you're going to make a change right um and advocating for us to know and recognize racism and recognize these things so i'm going twice as hard for that so even if this doesn't pan out to be anything mm -hmm. they at least they know that this black girl is not going to be silenced just because don't play with her mm -hmm. don't do that i'm going to encourage anybody else to file a complaint and just keep it moving so i'm going to go twice as hard that way i love that and i'm i'm so impressed by you that you're you're still there um, in that workplace, you know, battling it out, which is why, you know, for the viewers who are wondering, we're not naming them um, because you, you don't know um, what's the next step for Ms. Crystal. But we do want to talk a little bit about your businesses, right? You've got yeah, your yeah. own business yeah. ventures that we want to give shine and light to because of course, Black women, we, you know, we do all the things and you've got 
your side yeah. hustle. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I've, I've actually been doing this for quite a while on the side and it's coaching. It's personal branding and success coaching. Okay. Um, I'm an introvert and I typically help introvert women uh, to be seen and heard authentically and in whatever way. So whatever ways, you know, that you want to define your success, let's, mm -hmm. you know, find what that is and let's strategize how to get that and how to show up authentically. What does that mean? Be comfortable in that and then let people rise up to you versus you mm -hmm. always having to, you know, kind of like accommodate to them. And so um, I help women, you know, in their image, right? Mm -hmm. uh, style, uh, maybe career growth, um, right. and, or it could just be brand. Like, what is your brand? Let's 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 uh, get that solidified so that the right things come to you. So that's yeah, amazing. I, I've so you're helping people. your best foot forward on Facebook. They can find your best foot forward, okay. and yes. then uh, it, mm -hmm. and then LinkedIn. It's just uh, LinkedIn. Ford. It's just Crystal, it's Crystal M. Ford, um, okay. or if you look up Crystal Nicole Agency, and Nicole has an H, an I-C-H-O-L-E. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I go live and I give tips, and, and, and it's just about, um, you know, my philosophy is, and I do believe that everyone deserves to be seen and heard authentically. And when I say seen, I mean seen as an acknowledged and right. heard as an understood. Everybody at the bare minimum deserves that, and that's what I help people do. Amazing. So you guys can reach out to Crystal at the Crystal Crystal Nicole Agency um, or find her on Facebook or Instagram, all major platforms. Thank you so much for being a guest, Crystal. This was an awesome conversation. If you've enjoyed the episode, don't forget to click like down below, subscribe to the channel. There is more where this com came from. And I look forward to seeing you again. I appreciate you um, joining me for this episode and uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye. So Thank you.